the way this is going to work is we're going to sort of go back and forth. Um, and there's a lot to cover uh, to, to give you a full view of 50 years of queer Jewish liturgy, as the title promises. So we're going to focus in on six specific areas that might give you a bit of a snapshot that will give you a flavor of the diversity and the range of liturgical development over that time. And so to get us started, um, I'm going to share my screen and I've got some images um, and some text that we're going to be using throughout. And so then when uh, Rabbi Lippman is talking, we'll switch over to her, but it'll still be my screen. So we'll just have one screen share. So I'll go ahead and get that started. So just give me one moment. There's always the moment where you actually have to do the sharing of the screen. And apologies that it does take a second. Okay, so um, Jane, can you nod? This looks correct. Yes, we're good. Okay, thank you. Um, so what you're seeing here is I just wanted to kind of give us a flavor first of uh, what we're uh, going to be engaging with. Uh, so the first gay and lesbian synagogues um, were founded in the early 70s. The first actually founded in New York in 1970, the House of David and Jonathan, but it only lasted about six weeks. But the first gay synagogue to really have staying power um, was formed in 1972 in Los Angeles, Beth Chaim Hadashim, the House of New Life. And you see some pictures here from the early days there. Um, just to kind of give you, wanted to bring us back in time and get us imagining the fabulous fashion choices people were making in the era. Um, and then the idea quickly spread. And by the height of the gay synagogue movement, there were gay and lesbian synagogues in major cities across the country, depending on how you define them anywhere from 15 to 30 of them. The, the synagogue in New York, Beit Simchat Torah, founded in 1973, and here are some images of them as well. But we're here to talk about liturgy. So I'm now gonna shift back to BCC, Beth Chaim Hadashim in Los Angeles, and to think about the way that they engaged with liturgy in the earliest days. So what's important for you to know is that the majority of the services at BCC were Leila. They didn't have a rabbi until the 1980s. Uh, and they were managed by a lay ritual committee. And they generally followed a standard reform movement sidur or prayer book. They joined the reform movement um, pretty much right away after being founded in 1972. And they found strength in using reform movement prayer book and guides for services. And the services there generally, the material in the prayer book was like the prayer books in most other synagogues. It wouldn't necessarily have looked that dissimilar to what you would have seen in other small reform or liberal synagogues across the country using a basic, basic Ashkenazi Kabbalat Shabbat service. They generally only had Friday night services. Um, and they did a mix of traditional Hebrew prayers, English translations, and poetic readings that were mimeographed or photocopied together and stapled and handed out to people at the beginning of services. So they're creating their own material, but they're using pretty standard uh, prayers, pretty standard blessings that they're getting from the Union Prayer Book of the Reform Movement and other sources. But what I want to call attention to is that even though they rarely were creating wildly new prayers or drawing direct attention to gay and lesbian lives, gay and lesbian people within the space of their sidur or their liturgy, they were doing so subtly by making strategic choices. They were allowing for queer subtext, queer content, queer illusion, queer meaning to surface through the context of being in a queer defined space with gay and lesbian people holding together a Shabbat service designed to mark gay and lesbian community. So that the, the gay meaning, the queer meaning is always there, but it's beneath the surface and you have to look a little closely to find it. So I'm gonna give you two examples. Here is one from the second anniversary of BCC, which was also marking their official induction into the Union of American Hebrew Congregations, the Reform Movement. And the service opened with a series of blessings for love, brotherhood, and yes, that was the word they used. Um, they hadn't quite um, responded to sexism in liturgy uh, in a lot of detail at that point. Love, brotherhood, peace, friendship, precisely what so many gay and lesbian Jews were seeking when they went to BCC. Of course, you could say that that's the same thing that most people seek when they go to a synagogue, right? But framing such an important service, the second anniversary service, the service celebrating their introduction into the reform movement, 
with these kinds of blessings had special meaning. Here in this context, love, brotherhood, peace, and friendship take on a new sense, right? They take on the sense of a Jewish space being marked by an affirmation of same-sex love, of gay and lesbian brotherhood and sisterhood, of communal peace between gay and non-gay Jews, of friendship, a common, a common euphemism in the 70s and even into the 80s actually, for same-sex romantic partners. And here's just one tiny example from this you know, hour-long service, a very short reading um, before the candle lighting for Shabbat, um, read by Shirley Eichberg, the wife of Norman Eichberg, who at the time was the head of the reform movement's Pacific Southwest Council, so Southwestern United States. And by the way, note that Shirley and Norman Eichberg's son, Rob Eichberg, was a gay man who went on to become a well-known gay rights activist and an author who co-founded National Coming Out Day. He died of AIDS in August 1995 at age 50. So Shirley Eichberg is reading here from a text adapted from Martin Buber's classic 10 Rungs, Collected Hasidic Sayings, in which he's quoting the Baal Shem Tov. And as you can see, if you read this, the, the reading wouldn't have felt out of place in any synagogue in America, really. But given the timing of this special service and the context of a primarily gay and lesbian audience, the organizers of this anniversary service included this reading for clear references to one, census hatred, stand in for homophobia, presumably, the phrasing of men hiding their faces, and women too, presumably, as a reference to the hiding of gay and lesbian people in the closet. And then a world of census hatred, a world of people hiding their faces, loses sight of heaven, the reading tells us. But quote, when love comes to rule the earth, in all its diversity, of course, including same-sex love, which would have been self-evident to anyone standing in that space. And when those in the closet, quote, reveal their faces, then, quote, the splendor of God will be revealed. Thus, the subtext of this reading suddenly takes on a messianic vision of a redemptive future world in which many of the demands and hopes of the gay liberation movement have been realized. Here's another example. This is about a two-page poem. I've just cut out a few brief snippets to give you a sense of its meaning. And it occurs in the BCC Sidor as early as 1972. And as you can see here, it talks about a, some kind of internal essence that each human has that precedes the quote, form of the gendered body. It says, it is absolutely true that we are both man and woman, woman and man, regardless of the bodies we inhabit. Essence precedes form, and the essence of the form can be deceptive. It suggests that allowing one's, quote, essence, or it says later, living out one's natures, leads to liberation, leads to redemption. The poem implores the reader to live out, quote, saying, live truly what we are, regardless of the form we inhabit. A broad reading of this poem wouldn't just see gay and lesbian inclusion, but potentially the inclusion of, and recognition of transgender bodies. The idea that the embodied experience of recognizing a gendered essence can be distinct from bodily form. We don't know necessarily the intention of this poem, nor do we know how individuals at BCC at the moment would have understood it. But within, again, the context of queer identified space, a Kabbalat Shabbat at a gay synagogue, we can presume that the readers and congregants during the service would likely each have developed their own interpretation, and many gay lesbian attendees would have noted the queer subtext, even presuming the multiple and diverse queer ways of reading this poem. Reading it queerly, just as the previous Buber reading, requires being attentive to subtext, to context, to the values and concerns that would have been on the minds of those who created the service and those in attendance at these services. And generally at BCC, these are the kinds of readings they had. They rarely explicitly referenced gay and lesbian identities. They rarely talked about societal homophobia or the gay liberation movement in their liturgy. But they attended to those very issues through subtext, through context, through careful selection and curation of prayers, of poems, and readings. Things that would not necessarily have felt out of place, as I already noted, elsewhere, but took on new meaning, would become pregnant with meaning, when read intertextually against and within the context of the texts of the traditional liturgy. 
I'm now going to hand it over to Rabbi Lippman for a discussion of feminist innovations. So in the um, early years of the gay synagogues, there was mostly a gender division of, uh, they were primarily founded by men and uh, were male-centric places. The, um, the parallel uh, was not um, feminist or lesbian synagogues, but uh, rather uh, smaller groups uh, similar to Havarot uh, in the Havara movement. And also I think there's a way in which technology um, influenced um, influence structure at this point, because as Greg was saying, the um, early synagogues had mimeograph machines and used mimeographs. By, by the mid seventies, the public Xerox machine, which was much cheaper, had replaced the private mimeograph machine and allowed for kinds of um, cut and paste that were not really um, possible until that time. And so, um, both the social um, advent of, of the Havara movement and the technological advent of uh, public uh, copy machines. And lastly, uh, the women's movement as a whole um, influenced uh, Jewish lesbian and Jewish uh, lesbian, bisexual and non-gender conforming women to come together. And what I've chosen to show you here is a piece from uh, Dyke Chavez, which was a, a group in uh, the Bay Area of uh, lesbian, uh, bisexual, and non-gender conforming women. Um, that, uh, and if you can see it, you can see um, that uh, it's it's a Xerox. That uh, the Hebrew is hand lettered because this is before there were Hebrew word processing, and so uh, the Hebrew is. Um, in feminine grammar. It's from the song Ma Tovu, which is the morning, uh, the introductory song of the morning service. Uh, the uh, historical version and what's in the Torah says, Ma Tovu Ohalecha Yaakov Mishkenotecha Yisrael. And uh, it's usually sung in chant form uh, in rhymes. And this has been substituted with Ma Tovu Oholayich Leia Mishkenotayich Rachel, which um, uh, has the same uh, rhyme scheme as, uh, as the historical version, but substitutes Leia and Rachel, who are the um, partners of uh, Jacob Israel, uh, and uh, refocuses it, uh, recenters uh, on the female presence. You can also see that there's uh, illustrations, there's uh, a sort of a, a prehistoric, if you will, liar, which uh, uh, harkens back to a mythical pre-patriarchal -patri age of the goddess and, um, and a, a woman, a modern woman with a harp and grass down below and a sunrise that it's, it's all very evocative of um, a, a feminist messianic, a Jewish feminist messianic vision. How goodly are your tents, Leah, your dwelling places, Rachel. This I think is really symbolic of, a, of the rise of um, the female queer space that eventually will become blended with, in, eventually the women um, in, in these spaces, which I, I think existed in most um, big cities, uh, particularly with a large uh, LGBTQ um, population, Los Angeles, the Bay Area, New York, Philadelphia, Chicago, um, had uh, these kind of women's groups. Uh, th this was post the era of the Lavender Menace. So um, there had been a division between um, straight women and gay women also and that um, uh, gay women were not as comfortable, lesbian women, lesbian bisexual women, were not as, as comfortable in straight feminist spaces. Uh, there had been um, a purging in uh, non-Jewish spaces and secular spaces, and that most of the Jewish women involved in this were very involved in secular feminist politics and so had been, had been part of that kind of 
purge of the lesbian element. And we're meeting in um, safe, separate, lesbian, bisexual, uh, and non-gender conforming queer spaces. Um, Greg, I think I'm gonna hand it back over to you because I, I wanna keep us on time here. So now going back to just giving us images to kind of set the tone, we're gonna to shift to San Francisco and congregation Shar Zahav. And if you can see closer on the screen, loving the short shorts there um, and the fabulous 70s attire. Um, gradually, the uh, gay synagogues throughout the US, and by the way, I'm using gay, here is a shorthand, that's generally the word phrasing they would have used at the time. Um, LGBT and LGBTQ weren't quite in use then. Um, so I recognize that uh, that's not quite what the language we would use today, but I just want to be clear, historically, gay synagogue, gay and lesbian synagogue is a language that would have been reflective of the times in the 70s and 80s. Gradually, these gay synagogues began adding more explicitly um, gay and lesbian content into their liturgy. I um, mean, here's a fantastic example from Shar Zahab's High Holiday Prayer Book, The Mock Sword from 1983 a blessing that names the diversity of the congregation, specifically referencing diverse sexual orientations, diverse genders, but also interestingly, uh, a broader sense of diversity, of religious backgrounds, of different levels of spiritual <coughs> engagement. Excuse me, I have allergies, apologies. Um, so it's talking about how pleasant it is to gather in a rainbow of affections and sexualities and house of God who loves each of us as we are created who loves without limit and power, those with firm beliefs together with those who have, whose hearts have doubt, right? So even making space for people who might be atheist, agnostic, people whose connection to Judaism might be tenuous. But the real depth of engagement with specifically and emphatically gay and lesbian content really begins to happen with the AIDS crisis, which begins in 1981, at least officially the recognition of the AIDS crisis. On June 5th, 1981, the Centers for Disease Control reported on an unusual cluster of pneumocystis pneumonia among previously healthy young gay men in Los Angeles. And it's that report that is generally understood as the first official documentation of the epidemic that was first called gay cancer and then gay-related immune deficiency before taking on the name AIDS. And already within four years, by 1985, 15,000 Americans had been diagnosed with the disease and the vast majority had died. In early 1985, as a response to the AIDS epidemic that was beginning to devastate their community, the Shah Zahab in San Francisco um, Ritual Committee introduced a communal Mishabera for healing, adding it to the Friday night services. This made Shah Zahab's use of the Mishabera one of the earliest examples in the Reformed Jewish world of reintroducing this traditional healing prayer. We are now so accustomed to engaging with the Mishabara for healing in most Jewish settings in the US, not just reform, that we often forget that prior to the late 1980s, it was entirely unknown in the reform movement. It did not exist in the Union Prayer Book. It had been completely removed from reform prayer for well over a century. Its reintroduction was a response to the AIDS crisis and it was reintroduced in multiple contexts by individuals at Shar Zahav, by individuals at Beth Chaim Hadashim, BCC in LA, but also by the famous, the now very well-known and famous tune by Debbie Friedman and Dora Seidel um, that is still sung to this day in congregations worldwide, which was actually sparked and inspired by their recognition of the trauma of the AIDS crisis when they were writing that music. At Shara Zahab, this use of the Misha Barak um, was innovative, not just for being one of the earliest such uses, but also because they divorced from the context of a Shabbat Torah reading. Normally, the Misha Barak for healing in a traditional service and an Orthodox or conservative service was something that would have been said after an Aliyah, after calling up to the Torah on a Shabbat Torah service. Um, instead, it was read at Shara Zahab at all services, including Friday night services. And it was also no longer recited just for those in need a physical or emotional healing um, within the congregation or community, specifically calling out individual names, the ones who were being honored with the Torah, but for everyone in the community, whether they were in the building or not. This idea of publicly personalizing the blessing by calling out names of those 
in need of healing. Again, something that's now normative in mainstream American Judaism and in Jewish congregations around the world, but was newly being introduced in this era. And at Shar Zahab, the traditional wording was changed to specifically mention AIDS, asking for healing for, quote, all the ill amongst us and all who have been touched by AIDS and related illness. And it centered and thus publicly named the core embodied trauma then ripping through the gay community. It also changed um, the language of the Misha Barak's entreaties for healing. In the rabbinic tradition, there's a caution against tefillat shav, or false, vain, or useless prayer. And Shara Zahav's then newly ordained rabbi, Yoel Khan, you see him there in the center with the mustache, um, felt that in the face of AIDS, when the disease was still largely a death sentence, the words of the traditional Misha Barak for healing were a tefillat shav, because healing in any meaningful fashion really couldn't be expected. So instead, it was reframed as a prayer that reflected the truth of the world in which they actually lived, reflecting gay and lesbian experience in that moment. The language was broadened in both Hebrew and English to include spiritual healing as a messianic hope for the community. It spoke of, quote, bonds of love and caring. And it spoke of granting of courage and hope to the sick and the well. And it closed with a request for the divine spirit to reveal compassion and blessing upon all who are ill and comfort them. And then it ends with, let us see together a day of complete healing, a healing of body and a healing of spirit. This day of complete healing is imagined as a future redemptive moment for the entire community, not just those currently facing illness or grief. And it envisions universal healing, not just the healing of any specific body. So I'm now going to hand it back to Rabbi Libin. So um, I would just like to comment on, on one thing, which is that saying the names had become a, an important ritual in and of itself, that it was no coincidence that the, the individualized character of the prayer, because this was the time also of the names project and the AIDS quilt, in which remembering people's names, there was a great fear in the um, gay and lesbian bisexual community uh, and some transgender community that um, that people would just be forgotten. That uh, most uh, LB, LGBT people at that point did not have children um, or were alienated from their, cho their children in a previous uh, straight marriage. And there was a, a worry that they would just disappear, that the, all the these young, people who died of AIDS would be gone. And so there was a real effort to say out individual names as a, as a form of affirmation and remembrance. Uh, similarly um, to the healing prayer, there were also specific Kaddish prayers. Um, the one uh, I remember best is who, who will say Kaddish for me, which is um, the prayer of uh, someone who is clearly gay, who doesn't have children because of being gay, because in those days it was a, um, not expected and uh, quite um, you know, frowned against to say the least. Um, and so you know, there's a, a calling out for that. I'd like also now just to shift for a minute, which is uh, away from uh, liturgical wording to uh, symbolism and to come to uh, the red on the Seder plate, which later becomes an orange on the Seder plate. Uh, we have here as, uh, uh, yeah, I think that some, uh, uh, we see in the uh, chat uh, some, uh, some comments that I'm gonna just try and uh, address at this point. Uh, the origin, uh, the image we've chosen to use here is from Rebecca Alpert's bread on the Seder plate. Uh, which is about Jewish lesbians. The origin of the bread on the Seder plate was uh, a group of Jewish women, the Bay Area Jewish Women's Collective in 1977 or perhaps early 78, had a conference of a Jewish, the first Jewish feminist conference in, in the United States. And afterwards at the local Hillel, the UC Berkeley Hillel, they had a series of speakers. One of the speakers was the um, wife of the local uh, Chabad rabbi, uh, uh, she was a Hindu langer, 
and Hinda spoke at Berkeley Hillel about, um, you know, the place of women in Judaism, women in orthodoxy. And uh, one of the people there asked her, what is the position of Judaism on lesbians and lesbianism? And Hinda answered, well, lesbianism is like, you know, a low level sin, sort of like eating bread during Passover. And that created quite a stir because for the Jewish lesbians in this room, eating bread during Passover was absolutely unthinkable. And so there was a way in which lesbianism was both dismissed and um, exoticized and vilified in ways that didn't work for the Jewish lesbian community of the Bay Area that listened to this speech. So then the next Passover, um, one of the people who had been there um, decided that um, they would put like bread on the Seder plate. They would put bread on their Seder plate, which was, and there was a, um, a, a very short liturgy that went like, that went with this, that said something along the lines of, um, we put bread on our Seder plate to symbolize how we're looked at by mainstream Jews. And when lesbians are fully accepted, we'll take it off, which was a, a, a sort of transgressive and um, rather militant statement about uh, you know, expectations and um, feelings of being oppressed and uh, fighting against oppression. Over the years, the group of lesbians, bisexual, and non-gender conforming women who did this in Berkeley invited a number of women, and evidently there were some women from Oberlin who came and took this tradition to Oberlin. Uh, in Oberlin, they were too uncomfortable with the idea of putting bread on the Seder play, which is you know, understandable, and uh, instead left a space on the uh, Seder plate, which they called sort of the space for bread. Uh, another group, and I'm not entirely sure where, had a piece of bread that was encased in plastic. And they put that um, on the Seder so as not to get actual breadcrumbs on their Seder plate, but to have a symbolic ritual about lesbianism and um, transgressiveness. Uh, at some point, um, the scholar and my friend. So I, I wanna really clearly say that Susanna Heschel is a person I consider a, a good friend and whom I admire a lot because um, I'm going to um, say some words that might sound critical of her, which I don't mean uh, to be critical, but um, when she saw this, um, the idea of bread on the Seder plate, she, was a, she saw herself as a, as a queer ally, that it was very important to be a queer ally. And for her, the transgressiveness, since she is a straight woman, was troubling because she did not view lesbianism as transgressive and, or gay men as transgressive. And so she didn't want a transgressive symbol, which is how good and well-meaning allies sometimes appropriate the language of the minority experience and uh, and in Dr. Drinkwater's words, fix it. And so she substituted an orange for bread. Uh, it's unclear why she chose an orange. Um, I tend to think that she might, this was a custom in Israel in the early days of Israel that they would take out their Jaffa oranges and put them on during Passover on the, on the table, which had a, a whole different symbolism. And I, I have, asked Suzanne about that and she has denied ever seeing that though she spent many years in Israel as a girl. Um, but somehow that orange st stuck with her. She used that as a family uh, symbol and it uh, took off. And in the spirit of fixing, and this is why I'm somewhat critical of the idea of taking rituals and taking rituals that belong to a community that you don't belong to and changing them is that in the spirit of fixing, this got fixed away from lesbians and gay men to Jewish women. And they're attached to it because of the weirdness of the orange, the story of a man who, uh, some, some man in Florida who uh, opposed having women on the Bema and said, uh, 
a woman on the bima is like an orange on the Seder plate, which is a story, the story was written after uh, the, the actual symbol existed. And um, I've read a lot of different stories about this. I wanna let you know that I was present at most of this so that uh, I have firsthand experience. And, um, and it, it is an odd thing to see one's own community ritual uh, transformed and just in erased. Um, and I've, I've, I read one article by a woman, a bisexual queer woman who said she growing up had used that ritual as a feminist woman's ritual for 20 years without knowing that it had started as a, a ritual, a lesbian ritual. And so I think it is important to um, reclaim um, lesbian uh, and bisexual and non-gender conforming women's ritual history and liturgical history. And um, when, if you're using an orange on the Seder plate, I hope that you will tell the real story of how it started. So now we're gonna jump ahead a bit. In fall 28, Shara Zahav, the synagogue in San Francisco, published their own Sidur, an edited and expanded version of 20 years of liturgical creativity. And here's my show and tell moment. It's a beautiful um, embossed burgundy volume and you can order it. I'll put the um, link up in chat and you can order it yourself. Um, at the time it was published, it was the largest and most comprehensive collection of LGBTQ focused Jewish liturgy ever. Um, and it includes a very wide range of rich blessings. Some of the things we already were talking about going back to the early days of the congregation, but also many new blessings. There were blessings there for um, gender transition. There were blessings for adopting. There were blessings for um, a new relationship, blessings for dissolution of relationship, a very wide range of moments in the lives and loves of LGBTQ people. But one blessing in there in particular got the attention of the press. And this ended up being reported in newspapers all over the country. They highlighted a blessing called for unexpected intimacy and focused on that to the exclusion of much else in this 668 page, very rich and beautiful book. And it sparked heated debates on blogs and social networking sites about the nature of queer sexual practices as well as Jewish views on the boundaries between the sacred and the profane. And the reason is that the title for unexpected intimacy uh, is um, a bit more subtle, and I'll turn to that in a moment, but it was presented in the press as a blessing for anonymous sex. So how did that happen? But before I do that, I just wanna explain the photo. Um, the Sidor, by the way, has had a cameo um, on the TV show Transparent. Um, it's there when the, ra the rabbi appears um, for the first time, she's bringing it with her. But more importantly for our photo on the left is from 2010 when Shara Zahav member Lisa Finkelstein is presenting a copy of Sidor Shara Zahav to the late Shimon Perez, the president of Israel. So it's, this, this book has been in some important places. So the blessing that caused this stir, which you see here in its totality, that's the entire blessing, was written by Shara Zahav member Eli Raymer. Um, in the book, you would find uh, the name Andrew Raymer. He, he, he's shifted the name that he uses to Eli. He's a writer and liturgist. Um, and it was indeed conceived as a blessing for anonymous sex initially. During the editorial process for the Sidur, the title of the prayer, which centers on an intimate and fleeting encounter with a stranger, shifted to, quote, a kavanah for unexpected intimacy. Kavanah is the Hebrew word that conveys intention or, or mindset for a Jewish prayer or ritual. But then in the final published form, the title as you see here, just for unexpected intimacy. And the words of the blessing are not clearly sexual in nature at all. Sparking Raymer to note that it could apply to quote, any exchange with a stranger that was deemed meaningful. And thus it would validate the core Judaic value of honoring the stranger. A note to the prayer, a footnote to the prayer in the, in the Sidur says, quote, intimacy can occur in many forms, emotional, intellectual, sexual, and in many places, synagogues, homes, parks, cafes, hospital waiting rooms. 
It continues, it is about sharing the deepest parts of the soul. Unexpected intimacy is something that can be sacred if we open our minds to it. Unexpected intimacy can make us holier and bring us closer to the divine, to the to divine, sorry. Um, and as you can see in the text, it focuses on this moment when Jacob wrestles with an angel, possibly God, possibly a stranger, um, rabbis and commentators on the Torah um, for thousands of years have debated the exact, exact meaning of the words in the original text in Genesis. Since the Blessings publication, interestingly, congregants of Shara Zahab have shared with Raymer and others um, some of the many meanings and uses for this created blessing. One of my favorite examples is a Shara Zahab member who thought of the blessing after an impromptu conversation on the street with a homeless woman, or another when two lesbian moms with newborn twins received a surprise offer of a night of babysitting from a friend. And she also gave them a gift certificate to their favorite restaurant. So as the sleep deprived couple settled in to a quiet romantic dinner for two, it was their first moment alone together in months. And in that moment, they realized, oh my, this is Andrew's blessing or Eli's blessing, um, a night of unexpected intimacy. And even if um, no one had known of the original intent for the blessing um, and its connection to potentially being inspired by thinking about casual sex, it remains something that evokes queer meaning because the story of Jacob wrestling with an angel has been the subject of countless homoerotic interpretations going back hundreds of years. I'm now gonna hand it back to Rabbi Lippman. Uh, early on, we talked about diversity in the um, Jewish queer world and the liturgy that came out of it. Uh, and um, I, I think we need to really understand that the diversity was limited, that there was a desire for diversity that wasn't fully fulfilled. And so, um, as uh, Dr. Drinkwater pointed out, uh, we see in the prayer the um, beginnings of welcoming of non-Jews, of agnostics, of atheists, of, of women, because the central welcomers at that time were the gay men who were trying to open up their space and um, it, not without um, pushback from other gay men, but uh, eventually, uh, the, the space became broader and broader um, and um, is still broadening. Uh, as, as we speak, um, I think there's really serious efforts being made in the Jewish community um, for um, uh, the uh, full, full diversity of um, Jews of color um, with um, Ashkenazi white Jews. And one of the diversities that in the queer community is of trans and non-binary Jews, which um, took a while. And uh, I think is, uh, again, uh, its moment has come. Uh, one of uh, the pioneers was uh, Rabbi, is Rabbi Ruben Zalman, uh, who took the, um, the idea of in rabbinic texts of twilight, which is twilight in, um, in uh, Jewish thought is the disruption of the binary, that there's a, a binary of day, a binary of night, and then the in-between of twilight, which is not part of the binary. Similar, um, parva is uh, the in-between of meat and milk, uh, silk, the in-between of uh, linen and cotton, so that there's, in, in rabbinic thought, there are a number of binaries and then they're disruptors. And um, Rabbi Zelman took this uh, idea and used it to um, create a place for trans and non-binary people who disrupt the gender binary. May the sacred in-between of this evening suspend our certainties, soften our judgments, widen our vision. May this in-between light illuminate our way to God who transcends all categories and definitions. 
May the in-between people who have come to pray be lifted up in this twilight. We cannot always define, we cannot always say a blessing. Blessing, blessed are you, God, of all who brings on the twilight. And there's, it's just a, a little bit, you, you can see there's, blessed are you, God of all. There's a, a little bit of push here of, of using the tradition and also radically changing it. Greg? So one last slide and then we'll switch over to Q&A, but this is very brief. I just wanted to also highlight some other sources for queer Jewish liturgy. Um, in 2020, this book, which I'm holding up my version, but you can see it there on the screen as well, um, was published by the CCR Press, which is the um, uh, Central Conference of American Rabbis of the Reform Movement, edited by Rabbi Denise Egger of Los Angeles of Congregation Cole Ami, and I'll put the link for that in the chat. Um, and it is a fantastic and amazing compilation of some older material from the 70s, 80s, and 90s, but most of it, the bulk of it, new material created and, and gathered by um, Rabbi Egger along with a group of, I think there were about seven or eight core people that helped, there was a committee helping her put together this book. And I also wanted to highlight that there's also the Sidor of CBST in New York, which can be ordered as well. Um, and I'll put that link up in the chat in just a moment. But now let's switch over to Q&A. Let me stop sharing screen. Uh, if I can figure out how to do that, hold on. There we are. So uh, I noticed in the Q&A um, that there was uh, a comment about Debbie Friedman and the writing of the Misha Barak from um, Linda Shivers. I, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. I, apologies if I'm not. Um, I want to clarify. So there were multiple inspirations for um, Debbie Friedman writing the Misha Barak. Um, officially, actually, it was written for the Simchat Hochmah, the 60th birthday and celebration of aging for Marty Cohn Spiegel um, in Palos Verdes, California. And it was written expressly at the request of Marty. She wanted a Misha Barak. Um, she was a member of a conservative synagogue congregation near Tamid in Palos Verdes. And um, wanted a new version of the Misha Barak written for her. And when uh, Debbie Friedman agreed, she sat with Dora Sadel, who were her then partner, and they talked about um, uh, Marty's needs. They also talked about Debbie's needs. And they also reflected, as Dora has recounted later, on the many, many people in their immediate core community who were then facing the trauma of the AIDS crisis, either as people who were sick, dead, and dying, or as caregivers. Um, including Marty's daughter, by the way, who was working for AIDS uh, Project Los Angeles, or Drora, who was creating Jewish liturgical service material for, or for people at this time related to AIDS. So there were multiple factors going on simultaneously there. However, Debbie has written, and Debbie has an essay in my book in which she says it was not, it was long, it was years before she, she became really sick and it was not written for herself. So in terms of other questions, um, I'm gonna now switch over to try and pull them up. Um, so uh, Jane, did you wanna to respond to these, um, just a little bit more about these comments about the orange and crust of bread on the Seder plate? I know yeah. I saw you engage in the, the chat Where, as well. I'm sorry, are they in the chat or in the, in the Q and A? Who's in the chat, sorry. Can you want to um, yeah. read so it says the origin of the crust of the bread on the Seder plate was a story written by Schiffer Lilith Free Woman and first published in the Dublin Woman's Haggadah and that there the space was called Makom, a space for all who've been left out. And that Makom is also a name for God, if you just want to add to that. Well, I, as I put in the chat, my Hamakom also is a euphemism for vagina. And uh, I, I think um, the search for names for God that um, reflect a feminist and lesbian consciousness um, often drift back to Hamakom. And I know there were several groups um, that called themselves Hamakom. Um, you know, uh, there is a, a cute story attached to it of the, uh, I, you know, the something, I can't even remember, Rebbe, the, the, some a, a Hasidic woman, Rebbe, um, that Shifra probably wrote but um, the origins of it are earlier than 1984 and are in the Bay Area. So 
I see also some comments about um, the Sidor from Beit Mishpacha in DC, which I'm about to put up a link for, where people can order a copy of that, um, and that they do include some material from Magid Eli Raymer. And um, Eli is also, uh, it's too bad this is a webinar, because otherwise it'd be fantastic to hear Eli sharing some more about um, the backstory of the um, unexpected intimacy blessing. Um, well, not not to not to um, pitch my organization on on another's, but I will. Um, CLGS, the Center for LGBTQ and uh, Gender Studies at the Pacific School of Religion, hosts a monthly Jewish query series, which you can go to our website and sign up for. And um, uh, Eli Raymer and uh, uh, Jay Michelson, who many of you might know of, and uh, Bernie Schlager are. Uh, going to discuss and uh, Eli's new book, um, Dancing Hearts, about gay men's spirituality on April 7th. And you're welcome to, everybody is welcome. Uh, that, uh, thank you, Greg, for putting, uh, I think th the idea that gay synagogues published their own Sidorim was um, uh, a move forward and a form of sophistication and also showed uh, uh, a sense of permanence uh, also, the fact that the reform movement, which is just extraordinary to me, because um, you know, the, when I went to rabbinical school, I had to leave the reform movement to be out. Um, that um, that the reform movement has come to the place of uh, publishing uh, an LGBTQ sidur is really uh, an enormous step forward for our community. Um, and for the movement. So I'm, I'm very proud of the movement, yeah. proud of our community and, and proud of Rabbi Denise, who's been and a leader from the beginning. For those who might not know, Rabbi Denise was uh, for a while the president of the Reform Movement's Rabbinical Association, the first openly gay or lesbian um, person to, to sit in that role. So um, you know, an amazing individual who was serving BCC in Los Angeles um, as her uh, first position um, as a uh, you know, fresh out of, I can't remember if it was as, as her intern or a fresh out of rabbinical school, but in the 1980s in the height of the AIDS crisis. I, um, I see somebody asked about CBST and actually Greg and I talked about that at, at the beginning because both of us are somewhat uh, unusually um, uh, Western United States oriented. And I, I did bring that up and, and uh, Greg responded to me, well, we can really basically only teach what we know. And um, neither one of us, uh, although I'm sure both of us have spent many Shabbatot at um, CBST, neither one of us was um, uh, uh, connected in any kind of uh, profound or um, meaningful way to that, that congregation. I would also say about um, uh, CBST, that they're one of the reasons, so as a scholar, um, I've done a little bit less work on that, is that if you go to the CBST page that I added there, there's an entire um, book that Rabbi Ayelet, Ayelet Cohen, who, by the way, is the new dean of the rabbinical school um, at the Jewish Theological Seminary, um, that when she was working as the um, associate rabbi, or assistant rabbi, I can't remember the title, at CBST with Rabbi Sharon Kleinbaum, um, she created a, a book on the history of CBST. So as a scholar, um, you know, we try not to redo what has already been done. So I worked less on CBST, but yes, they've they also had quite a bit of innovation. Um, the Shara Zahav Sidor, though, published um, in 2008, um, you know, covers a lot more ground. It, it was quite a rich, it's quite a rich source, um, but absolutely worth looking at all of them. Um, there were questions here about Rabbi Jack Reimer. Do you know anything about this question? It's, uh, Jane, it's, it says, I remember hearing about how early gay Sidorim would use reframing of Jack Reimer high holiday readings for people that are in the closet. Could you comment about some of these early prayers or places we could find them? That I'm not, I don't have context on. Do you? No. So some, Larry Neff wrote in the chat that at um, Beit Mishpacha in DC, they had used some of his readings in their mock source since the early 1990s. Um, but again, I don't have, I don't have more detail on that, unfortunately. And I see the highlight that Jackie uh, Maris, I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly, highlighting Sidur Devar Hadash 
um, which is new, which I was just introducing to my students in my uh, gender and sexuality and Judaism class, um, which uses all non-binary Hebrew forms and neo-pronouns for God, um, the first fully non-binary Sidor. What's interesting, by the way, about um, the uh, synagogues, BCC and Shara Zahab, is that um, although uh, they weren't trying to make God language uh -huh. non-binary, they did go through quite a bit of effort as early as the 1970s, BCC starting in 1975, and Shara Zahab starting as, 1970, as, as early as 1979, to write um, uh, non-masculine God language, New Sidorim, where they changed all the prayers to use non-masculine God language, which was quite innovative at the time. Again, one of those things, kind of like the Mishaberach, that we somewhat take for granted in liberal Jewish spaces today is like, yeah, of course, but there had to be someone who did it first. And it was, it was feminist Jews, and it was lesbian Jews, and it was queer Jews who were often the first people doing this starting in the 1970s. And often doing it um, not necessarily in a coordinated fashion. So there were people doing it in different pockets and in different spaces. So there were multiple people basically reinventing um, the Sidur simultaneously in the same way that we reinvent Haggadot, in the same way that we reinvent other Jewish liturgical um, texts. Um, lots of people are doing this as innovations and labors of love within their own specific communities and not necessarily even connecting to others who are doing much the same elsewhere at the same time. So I think what Greg and I have tried to show you is that there is a progression and that there's a, there's a point of, of when, you know, the, the earliest ones are select, you know, are quiet, um, you know, those who know, know selections of specific texts from Buber or Heschel or, you know, emphasizing love and friendship and uh, authenticity. And then we come to the place of published prayer books um, that are, clearly queer focused that's a journey and that's been a journey of 50 years that has um you know had uh its ups and downs but is clearly where we are now it's not where we began 50 years ago so though it's been a pastiche and uh you know it's been in different places at different times there's been a way that it's moved from that kind of uh, hiddenness to openness from uh, male God language and male human language, which uh, we saw in the, the earliest prayers we shared to um, an, uh, a welcoming of diversity, uh, a desire for um, breaking free of the binaries, uh, a queering of uh, Hebrew text and of Jewish text that goes far beyond the queer community, but the queering of Jewish tradition is really now part of mainstream, um, at least in America, mainstream um, Jewish innovation and creativity. And I want to notice something else in the chat from Marvin um, Kab uh, Kabakoff, again, apologies if I'm mispronouncing, about the sharing of liturgy through the World Congress. So for folks who don't know what that is, the World Congress of GLBT Jews, Keshet Ga'ava, which was founded in 1975, although with a different name and with her variants, um, which still in existence, um, was, is a sort of a sort of umbrella group for queer Jewish communities, um, whether they're synagogues or other types of Jewish LGBT social spaces, advocacy groups, et cetera. And absolutely, um, from the founding of the World Congress, people were literally going to conferences um, that they would have, you know, every year there would be an, a national conference and then um, every other year, international conferences, people would bring their cedarim. Often, you know, mimeograph pages or photocopy pages, spiral bound, paper clipped together and share. So things were going back and forth. So for example, um, some of the prayers and blessings from BCC were showing up at Shar Zahav. Some of the blessings from CBST in New York were showing up in LA at BCC and vice versa. And some of these things are traveling the world. They're showing up at the Jewish Gay and Lesbian Group in London. They're showing up at the Gay Jewish groups in Sydney, in South Africa, in Israel, um, in Germany, in Paris, in Buenos Aires, in Mexico City, um, et cetera. Uh, and there was a question about um, archives. There is no one, unfortunately, there is no one uh, repository for these sorts of things. Um, there is a reasonable amount of material, um, I guess reasonable is a strong word. There is some material um, at the American Jewish Archives in Cincinnati. There's a very small amount um, at the American Jewish Historical Society, the Center for Jewish History in New York. Um, 
the most of these materials are still held by the congregations themselves. So for example, Sharzal's material sits in boxes in the synagogue, actually in a crawl space above one of the restrooms, which I've been in, you have to get on a ladder, and it's very precarious um, to get up there. But trying to find ways, there's, there's plans to get some of these materials donated to other archives. There's a tiny bit uh, at the GOBT Historical Society um, in San Francisco. Um, the richest collection though is at the One Archives at the University of Southern California in LA, which houses the, the full archive of BCC in Los Angeles. It's the only um, synagogue that has fully had their archive donated, processed, and made ready for the public. Um, but again, there, there are processes to make that happen um, for other, other, other congregations across the country. Well, we really want to thank all of you for being here. Um, and uh, we want to let you know that we're coming back next month um, with a, 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 a conversation on uh, again, 50 years of queer Jewish history about the creation of queer families. And so um, we look forward, any questions we didn't answer today, we'll answer then. So uh, we look forward to seeing you and being with you then. Amazing, thank you so much. And links will be sent uh, to everyone in attendance uh, so that you can sign up for that program, which is gonna be on April 28th. We're so excited to welcome Greg and Jane back. Um, Thank you to both of you for this wonderful presentation and conversation this evening. Uh, and thanks to all of our attendees for spending this time with us. Uh, take care and have a good evening. Goodbye. Thank you.